So Scott, I thought I would start with a little story. Uh, Scott's been a, a long time uh, friend and uh, Pluralsight user. Like Scott is one of the few C-level execs that I know that actually you know, spends time learning technology. Like you've been a lifelong learner here. Like how, tell us about your experience with Pluralsight. Yeah, I can't remember. I've been a Pluralsight subscriber, I can't remember how many years now. It's been a and while. From the very beginning. And um, uh, I've known a lot of people that actually work at Pluralsight that used to work on my team. Yeah. And um, yeah, I know it's been great. And so yeah, I... I <laughs> 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 so I want to tell this story when I remember it was in the early days, it was probably like in 2010-ish, like over seven years, about seven years ago maybe, where we were up to maybe about 100 courses in the library, and we had just shipped this amazing ASP.NET course on, I think on MVC, it was when MVC yeah. was coming out. And uh, you really loved the course, and you came to me and said, hey, can we make this course free? And at the time I thought, man, like we've only got 100 courses. I'm not sure if I can make one free yet. And uh, you convinced me to do it. And then it was like right around the time of PDC or one of the big developer conferences. And you said, look, if you make it free, I'll blog about it. I'll actually mention it during my keynote. And like, it'll be awesome. Like, oh, sounds great. And so the day came and, uh, and he did what he said he was gonna do. And then it took all of our servers down. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't scalable enough yet. This was before cloud computing. Um, so do you remember that? I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. And uh, you know, it's just been an incredible journey. Scott is someone who really understands and appreciates the value of learning and learning technology and how developers think and operate. I think that's what makes you such a great exec. And what What's, what's now making such a difference for Microsoft Azure? You know, you, I mean, you created .NET, you essentially led us through that whole world, and now you've shifted your focus over to Azure, although I know you're still involved with all of that. And since you started leading the Microsoft Azure uh, teams, you've had over 100% growth year over year for like the last seven years running, which is incredible. They're growing much, much faster than AWS and really, in a lot of ways, uh, making a huge difference in the enterprise space around cloud computing. So first of all, congrats on the cool. success. Nice. Give it up for, for nice. that. Like, yeah. I promise I'll let you talk in a second. Um, you know, I just want to emphasize like how hard that is to do. What's the scale of your revenue right now from Azure? Uh, well, we don't, oh, you can't, you can't. we don't bring it out exactly, but we're about, uh, we're coming up to about $20 billion total in cloud revenue. $20 billion. Microsoft. So growing at 100% at that scale is just incredible. So first of all, congrats. And I want you to just tell us, like, what, you know, what is it that's leading to all that success for you with Microsoft Azure? What is it about the platform that's causing that growth? Well, I think it's a fun time right now in the tech industry. Um, you know, both in terms of just the richness of the different types of technologies that are out there, which I think, you know, for a lot of us learners in the room, it's a great time to geek out on just the amount of cool things we get to use. But, you know, I think also just looking to where we are right now as an industry, you know, 10 years ago, I felt like IT was kind of considered the sort of back office inside a lot of companies or cost center. Yeah. And, you know, now digital technology is literally the thing that every organization, regardless of industry, is looking to take advantage of. How do they get better connected with their customers? How do they really you know, change the way they actually deliver what they deliver? Mm -hmm. And how do they use data to kind of continuously refine their business model? And that puts all of us really at the center of, you know, you know a lot of people are calling the fourth industrial revolution. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's that confluence of both cool tech and then just enormous opportunity to use that tech to really change the world. Uh, is you know really what's leading to the emergence of cloud computing? Yeah, and um, you know, and we're trying to do with Azure and the Microsoft Cloud. You know, how can we kind of take uh, all that great tech and allow you whether you want to use the best of the traditional Microsoft ecosystem or the best of the Linux ecosystem? Mm -hmm. How can you use that together? And you know, how can we make it approachable? How can we actually provide a more productive experience? that gives you kind of a tooling and management experience that enables you to be, uh, deliver things much faster. Uh, and then, you know, how do we try to add unique capabilities, whether it's around serverless computing, whether it's our new Cosmos DB, 
um, globally distributed uh, database, which has a bunch of unique properties, whether it's around IoT, whether it's around AI. Yeah. You know, what can we do that's unique that allows people to kind of build those amazing applications and go much further than they ever could before? You know, I think I, for me, I've noticed that about you and your leadership. Uh, you know, as, as a lot of big soft, as a lot of software companies get really big, you know, one of the things that happens is they tend to become more closed. And one of the things I've noticed about you with everything that you've done in, in your career is I've always seen you actually push against that and try to become more open. Do you think that's a contributor to the success you're seeing with Azure? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly if you look at Microsoft uh, historically, and you know, even a couple of years ago, you know, I think people would thought, you know, we, we were much more considered closed source. Yeah. Um, and we were, and for the most part. Um, and you know, we've really tried, especially with our developer products, as well as with Azure in particular, to really change that to be much more around openness. And whether yeah. it's open sourcing.net, uh, whether it's with our Visual Studio Code tool, uh, which is completely open source, runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, um, whether it's around you know, the work we're doing with Kubernetes, whether it's the work that we're doing around Docker and containers and uh, Mesos and, and other orchestration frameworks. You know, it's, it's really trying to not just how do we use open source, but more importantly, how do we contribute back? Yeah. And you know, one, one milestone we hit this year was Microsoft became the number one contributor of any company to open source on GitHub. Mm. Uh, and it isn't like we just dumped a bunch of code there. You know, we're actually now with .NET, with VS Code, with our Azure SDKs, like every check-in people see, which makes it you know, hard sometimes to do a big announcements like we are next week, because yeah. you can see every check-in um, <laughs> in GitHub. But, uh, but you know, really, how do we kind of you know, yeah. really develop in the open and really embrace open source in a, in a pretty fundamental way? And it's awesome. It's, and it's been good that we're seeing business results as well from that, but it's, it makes it a fun place to work and hopefully a fun set of technologies uh, to use. I think, and I think they're connected. I think it does lead to the results. And I mean, it sounds like with VS Code, for example, like that openness is now leading to you know, some of the biggest companies in the Bay Area to be using, using those tools, which probably wouldn't have happened you know, five years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it's been fun with VS Code in particular. Uh, about half the people that use VS Code don't use Windows. And as far as we can tell, have no relationship with wow. Microsoft at yeah. all. Um, and you know the, the primary languages and technologies being used in VS Code are things like Node, or Go, or Python, or uh, front-end JavaScript development, mm -hmm. you know, which has not traditionally been our strength in terms of from a tool chain or a focus. And so it's been, it's been nice because we're just sort of meeting new developers that we have not had any relationship with. And uh, you know, it's, it's fun watching uh, you know, Google conference and um, they're using VS Code in the keynote. And it's not because we're sponsoring it, um, but it's just that's what their employees wanted to use. It's and awesome. you know, similarly, we're seeing that with many, many other different tech companies. And it's open source. And so you know, we're the primary contributors to the core. Yeah. But we get literally thousands of pull requests from people all over the it's world, amazing. and we're incorporating that in. It's amazing, yeah. And so let's go back to Azure. Like, tell me about you know, the, the things you're really investing in there. Like, what technologies are you investing in in Azure to make that platform you know, more accessible, more powerful for the world? Well, I think you know, there's a bunch of new technology uh, trends that um, you know, the, the industry is really experiencing, you know, whether it's around uh, much more flexible infrastructure and, you know, in particular, the usage of serverless computing. Yeah. And so we've, we've been a sort of early em embracer of serverless, not just so that you can kind of run your own code in a serverless way, but how can you take advantage of platform services, whether it's, you know, workflow orchestration or whether it's around identity management or others, you know, how do we use that serverless-based model to really drive both cost economic savings, but, but also just enable you to tackle problems that you otherwise couldn't have solved. Mm. Um, and so like, you know, think about cars that we're driving. If you buy a new car now, there's a, there's a good chance that car is connected to Azure. Yeah. Uh, if you buy a Ford or BMW or Toyota or Daimler or you know, Mercedes, uh, Renault or Nissan, you know, all of those are using telematics to stream IoT data up into our cloud. And you need a way that you can handle sometimes billions of events happening per second in a scalable way. And so you know, using things like serverless, using things like IoT, 
using the latest container technologies, using some of the new distributed data approaches, you know, is required because you just otherwise can't tackle these scale style problems. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, that, that, that's some of the fun that we're trying to do is, you know, how do we enable these new scenarios and then at the same time, how do we make it easy to be successful with them yeah. uh, and really make them approachable for all of us to use? You also seem to be uniquely positioned for the hybrid scenarios where you know, you've got this really flexible cloud infrastructure and you have you know, all these on-prem solutions and you want to have this like, you know, create this hybrid cloud environment that really moves you into this next, uh, this next era. So talk to me about how you help your enterprise customers with that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, most of what we see in terms of new apps being created in the cloud today, uh, certainly with Azure, are new apps. They're not sort of lifting and shifting of existing systems. Um, and so, you know, the IoT scenario I mentioned with cars, you know, is a brand new kind of application. You know, but the reality is almost all those new applications, if you're at a company that, that's not a brand new startup, you know, you've got existing investments and mm -hmm. you've got existing systems that, for the most part, still live in on-premise data centers. And so those car companies want to do their IoT and telematics in the cloud, but their CRM system and their system of record and all their service history is probably stored in an SAP system somewhere back in you know, a corporate data center. And there's no way they're moving all that to the cloud at one time. You know, some are starting to move different pieces yeah. of those, but the reality is you know, the estate that IT has today is huge and it's going to be a 10-year journey of migration. And so what we're trying to do with our hybrid capabilities, you know, how do we let people very easily mix those two environments together mm -hmm. so that you don't have to lift and shift everything to be successful? And how do we allow you to also take those new cloud technologies and also be able to use them on premises? And so we have something we call Azure Stack, which basically allows you sort of Azure in, in a box or several boxes if, if you have a multi-server environment. And it basically gives you kind of the same management portal, the same mm -hmm. management control plane, the same set of developer right. services in a way that you can stand up you know, in any on-premises environment. And so if you've got a legacy system, you can bring the cloud to it, uh, have it sit 10 feet away, still develop using those cloud technologies, and know that at all the new systems you're building on-prem, you can very easily just run in public cloud Azure as well oh, cool. in a seamless way. And being able to do that not just across infra, but across data, across identity, across your app plat, yeah. you know, is, is one of the unique things that Azure gives yeah. um, and is one of the reasons why, especially for enterprises, you know, we're seeing so much adoption is they, they really need that hybrid flexibility that we provide. Yeah, I, I, can, I really see that being like one of the big pain points as people look to moving to the cloud is how do I get from where I'm at today to that vision in the future and mixing them together. And it sort of brings up this other point around, you know, the technology skills gap. You know, you've, you're inventing all these incredible new technologies, which means, you know, and the way you go about building solutions for those, writing code for the cloud environment is different, it's changed. The way you, you know, evolve your old systems to that world, the way you integrate them and the, these hybrid environments like you're talking about. I mean, all these are skills now that don't necessarily exist out in the ecosystem. So how do you think about attacking that? Like, cause, because if people don't have the skills, you're not going to have people developing on the platform. And so what's been your strategy there and how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the things about the cloud that is both exciting because there's so much new stuff and the challenge which is you really can't sort of post a job posting and say, you know, it requires 15 years of cloud experience. Because <laughs> uh, no, no cloud's been around 15 years. Um, uh, people still do post that, but, uh, but, but it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And, you know, and so how do you learn both the technologies, um, but also I think, how do you learn the methodology? Yeah. And you know, that, I think that's one thing that also is sometimes missed as people think about the cloud, is things like DevOps isn't about you know, just individual technologies, it's really a whole different process for how you do development. Yeah. And, something that you've got to deeply learn uh, in a big way. And you know, one of the things that we focus a lot on is obviously documentation and our own content. But I think you know, partly why you know, I think we've had such a great partnership with Pluralsight is you know, having the ability to do longer form, more in depth, really, really developer to developer, IT pro to IT pro training or architect to architect training that really takes people through that journey, helps make them successful. It's not just about an individual feature, but really about the whole end-to-end -end mm -hmm. has been great. And so we've got, I think, four learning paths now 
set up specifically for Azure, each of which has you know, 10 plus courses yeah. on Azure on Pluralsight. Yeah. Um, whether you're a developer, whether you're a solution architect, whether you're IT professional, and um, you know, we're constantly updating it and making it better. And I think that's great for all the Pluralsight users, it's great for us, and uh, you know, hopefully it makes us all more successful yeah. uh, and makes our jobs more fun. Yeah, it's an amazing partnership. And if you're here this week and want to check it out, we have Microsoft has a booth here this week in the Partner Pavilion. And you can actually see all those learning paths and see the content that's been developed there, along with the Pluralsight IQ assessments for a few of those uh, key assessments, a few of those key learning paths that Scott just mentioned. So, it's all there, it's ready to go, and we're continuing to invest in it to, to build that ecosystem, to build that community. And uh, you know, in that process of building that partnership, I just want to give you some insight into who this man is. Like, you know, we, I was personally in some of the meetings with uh, our partnership team, which is led by Benson Metcalf at Pluralsight, as we sat and like, talked about what these needed to look like. And what I experienced there was, was Scott, who's, who's a C-level executive, a GM over this business at Microsoft, up on the whiteboard, like, you know, in his developer mode, outlining exactly what the content needed to look like for these developers. Like, that's how in tune Scott is with his community. And I think one of the things that helps you understand how to, how to best help them in that learning journey. Yeah. yeah. It's the fun part of the job. <laughs> <laughs> now, last question. How, how much time do you actually spend on Pluralsight.com right now? Do you actually go in there still? I do. I mean, I actually probably at least once a week visit the site. You know, sometimes I don't get a chance to watch a full course, but, you know, I also use it. It's a, it's a great signal for me in terms of, like, what topics and what courses are popular uh, and, you know, what's, what's some of the new technology and trends. And um, and so yeah, and so it's been it's been great to kind of hang out as part of that. Yeah. And then uh, you know, usually once a month, you know, I'll pick a course and download it or yeah. watch it while I'm working out or something on the treadmill. And it's a good way to kind of stay fresh and learn new things. So, and I'm confident it's it's allowed us to make the content for your community you know that much better. So yeah. it's just awesome. You've been a great leader. The Microsoft Microsoft's in good hands with you there. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Scott Guthrie. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. <laughs>